Good morning, everyone. This is Amber Painter, and I wanted to welcome everyone to the webinar Just Ask Partnerships that Provide Funding and Opportunities. My name is Amber Painter, and I'm the Southwest Regional Coordinator for the Indiana State Library's Professional Development Office. Um, I will be the moderator for today's webinar, uh, as well as the question moderator. Our presenters this morning are Susan Miller, the director of the Bedford Public Library, and Megan Martin, formerly Megan Barnes, who serves as the community engagement coordinator for the Bedford Public Library. I'd like to start off the webinar with a few announcements. This webinar is provided as part of the Tools, Tips, and Trends series. To register for other webinars available for this theme or other trainings available from the Professional Development Office, please see the Indiana State Library's events calendar, which can be found on our website at www.in.gov backslash library. For a full list of current in-person trainings, please see our continuing education website. The Indiana State Library has many ways we try to stay connected to library staff across the state. For weekly updates, um, please consider subscribing to the Wednesday Word, our weekly e-newsletter. We also offer a blog which provides information about the Indiana State Collection, interview spotlights on library staff from across the state, and information about upcoming events at the Indiana State Library. If you have any questions, just type it in the chat box on the upper left side of the screen. I'll be watching and we'll get your questions to the presenters as soon as possible. Just be advised that for today's session, we will be collecting all of the questions and then answering them at the end of the presentation. The session is one hour or 50 minutes, um, followed by a Q&A, and everybody who attends will get one LEU for today. Um, we're doing something slightly different from webinars in the past, where instead of receiving your, web, receiving your LEU in the mail, we'll actually be making that available as a direct download at the end of the presentation. If at any point during the webinar you experience any sound issues, please see the sound issues box just below the chat box on the left side of your screen. If there's a global sound issue, we will announce it in the chat pod. If you're unable to resolve the sound issue you are experiencing, we are recording this meeting and you can watch it offline after the meeting is ended. Again, if there's a global sound issue, we will make an announcement in the chat box. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to the presenters. Good morning, I'm Susan Miller, the director of the Bedford Public Library, and we are coming to you from an empty room in sunny southern Indiana. Bedford is about 25 miles south of Bloomington. We serve a population of a little over 34,000. And I will tell you just going into this that we primarily fundraise for programming only. So we will only be discussing that topic so if you are considering building a wing or renovating your library, we really won't be providing any information today that's going to help you with that. Um, a little bit more background on us is that last year we did have, we, we break our programming down the same as you would for your Indiana State Library report. So we had 23,644 children ages 0 through 11 who attended our programs a little over 1,700 that who were 12 to 17 who attended our program. So we have, we do a lot of programming and most of that programming is actually outside of our library. And I'm going to tell you why we are doing that. Um, I think you need to start at the beginning and for us the beginning of thinking of fundraising in an organized way was really in 2009 the year before we had lost a major employer. Uh, some of our other major employers were downsizing and we had an unemployment rate of over 14%. We really were a community in crisis. And at a board meeting, we started to think about how can we make a difference in our community? If we needed to target one specific audience, what would that be? We have several school administrators on our board at that time and we decided that we were going to go directly to children that we were having difficulty trying to engage parents to bring their children to programming, we were going to program where they were. And we have since 2003, we have been programming in our schools. We send our staff into every K through fifth grade classroom once a month. So we have really strong and seamless relationship with our schools and we decided to begin there. Um, 
another thing that really prompted us to think about this in a more organized fashion was that most of the fundraising was really coming from me asking people that I knew. And the library board became increasingly worried about the fact that I might retire before long and that institutional knowledge would disappear with me. So looking for a more formal way to have fundraising go on past my retirement. So we decided our target audience was going to be children and families. Uh, we were working on a strategic plan at that very same time, and we made sure that our strategic plan addressed community outreach, partnerships, and fundraising. At that time, we also talked about how are we going to do this, and that's really important. Are your board members going to help? In our case, they were all working full time, and while they were perfectly willing to help us set up relationships or smooth the way for us, they were not going to be able to be um, active fundraisers out in our community. We also needed to think about why we wanted funds. And this really will be determined by your own community, but in our experience, we have found you need to approach each potential fundraiser or potential fund partner with a specific need, not just, we want to build our community partnership fund which by the way is where we put all these funds, is Community Partnership Fund. Um, we needed to be really specific. We needed to tell them why it was important, why they were the perfect partner for us, what the outcomes would be, and then to give them really equal ownership. Um, I think that's really important. And you have to determine who's really going to take responsibility for fundraising in your organization. Like I said, in the past, it was me, really, uh, oftentimes informally. And we were really looking strongly at building an entirely different strategic plan than we had in the past. And as a part of that, uh, we had a young woman who was talking to us, taking notes, and was going to help us with our planning process. And she said, you know, if you ever decide to hire a person for that position, I have a friend that I think would be perfect for that position. Um, you know, as librarians, we tend to not take flyers on things like that very often. We like to have a job description. Uh, but within two weeks, we had Megan in here, talked to her on a Saturday morning without a job description, and hired her. Um, and sometimes I think that's a good thing because we really did not have a firm job description, and she was willing to take that journey with me particularly and say, okay, you know, I kind of know what you're looking for. We will work it out together as we go, and not everybody is going to be comfortable in that position, um, because it is a gamble. You're asking somebody to leave a full-time job that's pretty specific, come to you and just figure it out on the fly. Uh, but Megan's been here a little over three years, and I think that has worked really well for us. And I would tell you that if you interview someone against a job description that's very specific for this job, and they have a lot of questions and a lot of concerns, they're probably not the right person for you. Because this, this person has to be really flexible and willing to try new things and to walk away when they don't. And so I think flexibility is really important for the person that is hired for this job. Um, another thing that was important to us was that Megan had grown up here. And since we are a small, close-knit community, they really like seeing someone that they knew, or at least someone who shared common ground with them. And, and we had that in Megan, and that was really important. Um, we do have a job description for her now. It's, it remains fluid, and uh, it is going to be available for you at the end of this presentation. We will share that with you. So decide if you need to hire new staff, get them in, get them trained, and take them around. You know, make sure that those initial introductions are easy and smooth for them, and then start to push them out as a face for your library. Um, and for me, sometimes that was hard because I had always been that person. So it meant that I needed to trust Megan and have her go out and represent us without me being there. Because if I was there, oftentimes I was a distraction. So we really needed Megan to be there on her own, and she did that very well. 
and you need to share this process with your staff because they need to know where you're going and why it's important for you to get there. I think it is a journey and you need to, um, you need to make sure that your board, your community, and your staff are all headed in the right direction and everybody knows where you're going. For us, um, our strategic plan was really important and we were doing all these things at exactly the same time. We uh, shared copies of our plan with everyone. It's important that you market your vision, your mission, and your values. Uh, we brand everything. We want to make sure that if our communities see our logo, they know that it's us without seeing that our name is even on the side. And uh, if you see our logo, you will know that it doesn't have a book or any kind of material on it. It's a shooting star logo. Funny thing, uh, we um, came up with that logo because we have a local astronaut who's from here, and he had told me that um, he would sit on his porch, uh, not very far from the library as a child, and he said, I'm going to go be out there. I see those stars. I'm going to be out there with the stars. And I thought, endless opportunity. That is what we want. That is what we want for the children of our community, and that just kind of became our logo. Um, so as you have your branding, your marketing, your mission, your values, you're ready to go, in our experience we have found that we were more successful when we were asking for funding to support a certain program, like STEM camp, summer reading, a certain aspect of summer reading, um, having a presenter come in and letting them be a sponsor for that. Um, and we always say that we're looking for partnerships. We never use the word solicit <laughs> because we don't want the connotation that goes with that. Uh, but we're really looking for partners. And sometimes um, you find partners in ways that you don't anticipate. I think it's really important to be able to notice that because if you are so busy thinking about fundraising for yourself, sometimes you miss opportunities that will help you fundraise or build a partnership for another organization that's out there that leads to another relationship. And we're all in this really to build community, not just to build our own organizations. You always need to keep that in mind when you're out there fundraising. Um, we used data from our planning process. We shared that with others. We freely used data from other people's planning process. And our community was applying for a stellar grant, which we did receive. So they had spent a lot of money and collected a lot of data, which was very useful for us that we use in our planning process. Um, the next slide um, just shows our vision and our mission. Um, not going to read through that with you, but we really, you will notice when you look at our statements that we are not talking about books and we're not talking about materials. We're really talking about strengthening community, developing partnerships, and encouraging innovation. And that's really where we live. Um, libraries are expected to have books and materials and we can work that into this framework, but those were the three things that were really important to us. They also were things that our community did not expect us to be in the business of doing. Um, and I think that just in general, our community at that point was, they didn't really see us as planners. They saw us, saw us as material providers instead of planners. So it was really important to go to every meeting that we could, every planning process that we could for other organizations and show them that yes, indeed, we, we plan, we look for outcomes, we measure everything, we collect data, we can help you do that if that is not your strength. Um, we also developed a formal planning process for program planning in-house. Um, special shout out to any of you who might be watching from IMCPL because I first saw that process um, at an ILF program several years ago. Uh, we stripped that down to work for us um, because what we found we had a lot of staff who were thinking about planning programs, but they really, they did not meet our strategic plan. They weren't guided by our plan. So we developed this format so that we were not getting a lot of programming proposals 
that clearly we weren't interested in. Um, and I think it helped people who were planning programs that they, by the time they worked through the first couple questions, they had a pretty good idea if myself or the assistant director would look at that and say, yes, this is a program we're going to do, or really, we're going to pass on this one, or you're going to need to make changes. So I would recommend that you uh, incorporate some kind of a formal planning process. It also gives you documents to go back and look at later. Um, and be sure that you incorporate uh, key components such as, does this plan promote your strategic plan? What parts of the strategic plan does it address? Share those components with us because we're going to need to share these with potential funding partners down the road. We also have a budget component to this plan because it's really easy for staff to say, well, you know, it's only going to take two hours of my time plus the hour for the program. Well, they're not thinking about the hidden costs um, that might include publicity, um, materials, because the most expensive thing that we have at our library and probably yours are the people that you have. And that was always grossly under budgeted. So it helped them understand that our staff are really important to us and you're really expensive. And so we want to use your time wisely and we value the time that you have and the skills that you bring to us. And make sure that you include a requirement for anticipated outcomes. That is something that in our community, most funders do not get back. Um, you know, they may be asked for $500 for Little League or something like that, and they don't ever get any document or any kind of feedback or pictures or feel-good anecdotal evidence that makes them think, that was a really good investment of our time and our money. Um, the next few slides really just are our program planning process. If you have questions about that, you can email us or ask us at the end. Um, I would also tell you to really look for um, things that people can bring to the table that may not be money. We have really good staff and program ideas and program providers. We have one room that seats 37 people. So what is most important to us in a relationship is space free space that we can use. So we really, uh, we have a great relationship with our schools. We are working on a relationship with our city because they are building some new meeting space and we want to be able to use that on a regular basis. And it helps us because do we really want to do a $2 million bond issue to have a larger meeting room that we use 10 times a year? Probably not. Uh, but it helps the community value the space that they have if they see that it's being used well. So the city is getting ready to build a new arts um, and education center. If we go in there and we do a program every couple of months or every month over time, they're going to see more value in that space that's owned by the city. They're going, the city is going to value us as partners. Everybody wins and taxpayers feel good. So you may not be able to put a solid dollar amount on that, but it is a really important relationship for you to develop. Sometimes we want money, and sometimes that is uh, what people have to give. Uh, oftentimes banks or insurance agencies, sometimes even other nonprofits, it's just easier for them to give you a check. So by all means, you know, if money is what they want to give you, be sure and take that. Um, sometimes they do not have money or space, but they have some extra time, or they have a special area of expertise, they, or they can provide you with publicity or just support. They can link you to somebody else. Um, one of the things that I was able to do lately that I had a very small part in but makes me feel really good, and it is an example that um, I will use forever, is a couple of months ago I went to a meeting and uh, there were several people there and they were talking about the lack of funding and support for vocational school at our local high school. And I went home and talked to my husband and I said, they really need new equipment um, because the equipment they have is several years old and these students are not learning how to use new CAD equipment and equipment of that type. And he said, well, 
you know, that sounds like something that could be a match for my organization. And two weeks later, the school corporation had a check for $40,000 so they could buy new equipment. So sometimes what you bring to the table is listening to what other people need and thinking, I know somebody else that has time, money, or shared interest that might work for them. So people start to see you as a valuable partner who can make things happen for them, who will be in the right place at the right time. And that's really important too. And then uh, Megan will talk specifically about things that we look for, but sometimes you need food. And a lot of you out there are probably laughing, but there are you know, free pizza, free bottled water, free, free candy, granola bars. I, you know, we try to do healthy snacks, but sometimes 140 packages of M&Ms is just what you need, so don't be afraid to ask for that. I'm going to finish up just by saying that it's important to be visible, to listen. Um, for years, we were told we should talk more. I would say now we probably need to talk less, listen more, so that we know what's important in our community and what we can bring to it, how we can build community. And I would say as you ask for money or support or try to build relationships, you need to be in the building activity or you know in the business of making your community better. Uh, not thinking about a STEM program, but thinking about career ready, making students career ready down the road. Things that you can't measure um, and may never be able to measure. So it's really important to collect that anecdotal evidence Participate, always be present. If they expect you to be there, be there. Be there on time, be there early. Help other organizations. Make sure they know that they can count on you. Be open to new ideas. Uh, sometimes you take a risk and it works and sometimes you take a risk and it doesn't. Just walk away and um, you're not a failure because something didn't work. And be accountable. Be sure that you have statistics and information that you can share with funders and the community so they know how important the program you're doing is to the community. And then they can take that information and share it with others. And that helps them build value as well. Megan's next. And she is actually our director of community engagement. So she is the hands on or feet on the ground and person out and about in our community. And her information is going to be a little more specific. Good morning. OK, so Susie talked a lot about um, the background of all of this. So from there, I come in. And um, so when you're looking for an organization that you're going to, or a person that you're going to ask for money, you want to be knowledgeable and personable when you deal with them. So like she said, we're involved in a lot of outreach. That's a big deal because you want to be visible in the community. Your organization needs to be visible. We get told often, oh my goodness, we see you guys everywhere. That's exactly what we wanted to hear because we try to be involved. We try to be out there so people look at us and say, man, what a great organization. What a great cause. I would love for my money to go to help that great cause. So if your organization is being visible, that's going to help you. And then if you're the staff person, like I am, that that is your job, it's really valuable that you attend as many meetings, as many chamber events, be on as many committees as you can possibly handle, be out there, be known. That way when people see you, they, number one, associate you with your library, and they think, oh, yeah. I saw you guys in the newspaper doing this. I want to talk to her about that. Then you're out there. People have the opportunity to reach out to you, and you have the opportunity to reach out to them. You want to research the company or the staff members of the organization that you're asking for money. You don't want to start talking to them and have no idea what they do at their job. You want to know that person and know as much about them and their organization as you can, so that way you have something to build off of, because sometimes when you're you know, at a chamber networking event, you don't know this person very well. So that gives you something to walk up to them and say, like, oh my goodness, you work for this place. I love that you guys are currently doing. And throw that out there. It gives you that bridge. And then you can talk to them and hopefully learn a little bit about, number one, what they do at their job. And then maybe a little bit of personal information. And you can build that as a relationship. 
Make it a friendship. Get to know them. If they mention their kids, ask about their children. People love to talk about their lives. Let them, you know, be involved, care about them, and really build that relationship. It's going to help you in the end. It's going to help your organization. Even if they don't give you anything, they're going to be talking about how great you are, and that's going to help you. Um, learn about their interests. If you are looking into an organization and what they really care about deep down to their core is helping the homeless and you're wanting to ask for money for a science program for children, maybe not the organization you want to ask. So know what their interests are as an organization and them specifically. If that person that you're going to ask for, let's say like once again the STEM program for kids, you know they have a fourth grader who's really interested in science. If they're high up in that company, they might be able to walk in there and ask for that and if they really mean it, you're probably going to have a lot better chance at getting what you're asking for. So then it's important that you know what you're asking for. So Susie showed you the forms that we have to fill out. Those are great to fill out because they make you think through everything before you walk in there. You want to know exactly how much money you're going to need to make your program happen. So you filled out that budget sheet. I know we flipped by it pretty quickly, but we'll send it out at the end as well. Um, but fill out that budget sheet. See where your money is going. Know if you're going to you know, spend it on certain supplies. Know if you're going to spend it on food for the kids at this program. Know where your money is going to go because if you're asking for five, six, seven, ten thousand dollars $10,000, people want to know exactly what the money is going for. They want to know, oh, it's being spent specifically on this item to help, I don't know, adults with literacy versus, oh, am I paying for their staff? So if you can have that already figured out, that's going to help you. And then make sure that the way you're spending your money relates to your strategic plan, your mission, and your vision. We showed you that quickly as well, what our mission and vision are. So then, you know, ours are focused on strengthening community, developing partnerships, encouraging innovation. So everything we do is geared towards that. If it's not, we take a look at it and we say, well, maybe this isn't a program that we need to be doing right now if it's not leading us forward. So we go from there. We base everything off of those. I had said, um, or Susie had mentioned, how staff time is so valuable and it's one of the most important things. So when you're asking for, if you're asking for funds, um, it's really important to show whoever you're asking you can just show them that budget sheet and it has on there the staff time that you're spending. So they see, okay, so I'm putting forth maybe $500. They're putting forth 30 hours in two weeks worth of staff time towards this. They're seeing that you're also making the commitment. You're also putting forth a lot of resources. The next one, I've not had to deal with too much, but I know that it does happen. So I just wanted to briefly touch on it. Um, is if whoever you're asking to give you funds has an opinion or input on what, how they would like you to maybe change your program, be very delicate with how you deal with that. If they feel very strongly about something, try to figure out a way to make it work with what you're already doing and with what your goals are. Take some time if you need to. Tell them, I'll go back. I'll talk with my director about that. We'll come back and see what we can do. If you just can't make it work, you can't make it work, but do your best because once again, you're asking them for something. They have the power to turn you down, so it is very important to care about their opinion in that. And if it's a small town like it is, and I think that even happens in big towns, everybody knows everybody, so you never know. Somebody might have a really important cousin or they might be best friends with the mayor. And sometimes you know those connections, sometimes you don't. So you don't ever want to burn bridges. Never badmouth any other organization to help, you know, make yourself look better. Never do that because it can come back to bite you and you don't want that to happen. So once again, you're going to try to make it personal. I always try to ask in person. That is a huge thing. I know it's the world of email, and internet, and all of that, but it's, so much better to walk up to somebody and be talking with them because how many, you know, telemarketer phone calls does a person get in a day? How many spam emails or emails for this or that do they get in a day? It's really easy to read an email 
and not even respond to it. And you can just play that off like, oh, I don't know, I didn't get it or I didn't notice it. Or a phone call, it's really easy to say no. We do it all the time to telemarketers, so it's just natural. It's easy to say no. So if you can, like I said, you've built a relationship with this person. Hopefully, you know how to set up a meeting with them since you are, you know, friends at this point, you could say. And then you set up that meeting in person. And when you're talking to them and you're sharing your passion and you're able to look them in the eye and they can see how much you care about this program you're wanting to do and how much you're willing to commit to make the community better, they're going to see that and think, whoa, if I'm going to turn this person down, I have to have a good reason to do so. So in that case, if you're there, you're more likely, far more likely to get what you're asking for. And then this kind of goes back to knowing what your money's going to go, but explain what exactly it's going to do. So if you're setting up a program, like we do one where we do, but we just did this one, um, backpacks for kids in a low income community. So that one is really great to be able to say, we're using this money to buy each and every kid an individual backpack that they've requested. We ask them, you know, what brand and what color and what character are your favorites? And we do our very best to get a backpack that we think each kid would love. So if you can break it down and explain that that money is going towards that, they're, they're getting a visual in that case. And it's so much more than, we need $3,000 to give backpacks away. If you can really give detail, it's gonna help you. And then share stories. If you know these people, like we know these kids who we gave these backpacks to because we program there year round, we can say, these kids, you know, they live in this neighborhood and their parents have this going on. And one of them the other day told me this big emotional story. You can share it. And it's warm and fuzzy. That's what's going to help you here is if you're running a program, make sure it's making that heartfelt connection that you obviously have or you wouldn't be in a nonprofit doing that. So make them see how important it is. And then statistics. Everybody loves statistics. Here's a good one for that backpack program we just did. It's for a low income housing community that houses, well, that has 115 kids living there. And the average household income is about $24,000. So that shows you that some of these parents might have to pick between feeding their kids that week or buying them a backpack. So you throw out statistics like that, people want to help you. Staying connected. This one is huge if you want to continue these partnerships that you have and continue getting funding from that same organization. You can just take their money and run and never report back, and that's fine. They might be willing to do it again in the future. But if you are keeping in touch and each time you do a program, you send them pictures, you know, you do your summer reading program that you asked for money and you have your festival, you send them pictures of that festival. They see all the people having fun. They see everything coming together and they think, wow, that's great. So then if you go a step beyond that, you can give them a flash drive that has a PowerPoint presentation with those pictures on it and the statistics that you give. And that's something that they can take to their board if they have a board and show their board, look at this, look what our, you know, our funds did to make this program exist even. And then, or if they have a CEO or whoever is above them, they can share that. If they ever have, um, you know, let's say they do a thing like a chamber after hours and they wanna show off this is some of the programs that we really help. They can pull all that information because then they have it to share. So that's great. They can be out there telling other people about the great things that they've done because you want them to feel it, but then it also reflects really well for you. Anecdotal stories. That's always very helpful. Once again, it's that warm and that fuzzy feeling that you want people to have. You want them to see that people, like real people in the community that you live in and that these organizations work in were helped by whatever program you put on. And you want to be able to share those stories, real things, because you were there, they may not, you know, they may have just given funds and never taken part in it ever again. And that's fine. 
that is perfectly fine. But they might want to hear a story, a, a few stories, and they might want to be able to go and say, wow, that really hit home with me, and I want to share that with everyone I know. And then, of course, statistics and outcome measures. As librarians, everybody wants their outcome measures. So always be keeping track of as much as you can. Keep track of how many people come. It's important information to share. Show appreciation. So no matter what they gave you, like Susie said, it could be anything. It could be space. It could be that they are donating water to you for a program, anything like that. Send a thank you card. I know that that's old fashioned, but it's really nice. There's nothing better than going to your mailbox in the morning and being like, oh, what's this little letter? And then you open it up and it's a thank you card for something you've done. It just really means a lot. It's very, very personal that way. And people think about it. Wow, they thought beyond just taking what I was offering. They really, really do appreciate it. And then if you have any public events, so you use the money to do your end of summer reading event, be sure to thank that person publicly. Make sure that they're the hero in the situation. They're the ones who offered up whatever they could give to make this event possible. Because yes, everyone knows that the library is putting it on. So you want to make sure that they know that it was them. And then invite them to attend. Everything that you do, especially if it's something that they funded, invite them to come and see. Maybe they're super busy and they don't have time, that's fine. But just the invitation is going to be another thing in their head of, wow, they really care. And invite them to everything you do. Every big event that you do, obviously not everything if you do. If you're like us and you have a program or two every single day, but invite them to everything that's major that you do. And then the next one, of course, if they don't want to be recognized, respect that. There may be various reasons that they don't want their name out there. Respect their, their wish to be anonymous and just say thank you. Just thank them anyway. Thank you to the donor who made this possible. And then, like I said, big events, you always want to make sure that they're invited. Because if they come to your festival or whatever it is, and they see, wow, look at how awesome this is. There are so many other community organizations that are here partnering with the library. And oh my gosh, there are so many people having fun. Over 500 people came. They're going to take that excitement with them, and they're going to go advocate into the community like, did you see that event? Did you go? Did you see that newspaper article? They're going to be out there talking about it. So they're going to be spreading the word for you. I mean, marketing is great. We struggle every day to figure out how do you contact people? You know, there's social media, there's newspaper, there's TV, but it's still word of mouth is still your number one marketing tool. So the more people that are out there advocating for you, the better. So then What's next? You always need to be thinking about the future and what what you're going to ask for money next because you never know when you might be at a meeting and the opportunity might come up and you're talking to somebody and they say, oh yeah, our organization, we have $2,000 that we're giving out and we really are looking for a good thing to do. Well, if you've already got one on the back burner, like our upcoming one is we were selected um, as one of two libraries in Indiana for the NASA at my library grant. So this is a big thing that we're going to push because we want to be seen in our community as STEM educators. That is a huge, up, obviously it's a huge field right now. And as things continue, it's just going to become bigger and bigger. So we need people who are going to be able to do those jobs. So why not start with children and get them excited about science, technology, engineering, and math now and see that it's more than just what they originally thought, and to open their eyes to these careers, show them how fun these things can be. So we've got NASA at our library now. We're using that as a kickoff to say, look, we're involved. We want to do this. Everyone be aware. We, you know, Teachers don't have time. They have a specific curriculum they have to follow. So they may not have this extra time. We do. We have the time and we have the resources. And we've got great programmers, so we're going to use it. So if you have that and then you're out somewhere and you maybe get a feeling that somebody has money or they tell you they do, you can say, oh my gosh, that's perfect because listen to what we have coming up that we are dying to do. 
And we would love to know why you want to use that money. We would love to take that money and purchase this equipment, another 3D printer, to be able to have 3D printing programs at the library. So everybody can engage in that from children through adults. So know what your game plan is. Have more than one if you can have more than one on the back burner and be ready. Just always be there. Here are some pictures from some of the programs that we do that we ask for sponsorship for um, many different ways. So we do ask for funding for food for some of these programs and then our big festivals. So there are pictures. We have girls doing STEM, so that's always exciting. And then of course the backpacks in the corner, that's 59 backpacks full of class, well, age appropriate school supplies. So we actually pulled all the school lists and filled them. So it's very, very fun as you can see. So now we'll move on if you guys have any questions. Okay, so it looks like our first question comes from Kim Blaha, and she wants to know how much time do you allocate uh, to spend on planning for fundraising? We actually do not set aside an amount of time, but I can tell you that um, this is not the only thing that Megan does for us. She actually works at the desk sometimes, and uh, she also is our person for 21st century scholars. So. On average, I would say she's probably doing 20 hours a week that would relate to fundraising types of activities. Okay. And then I see that uh, Stephanie Zurinsky uh, would like to receive program, the program planning worksheet. Uh, I had sent that out as an email attachment during the webinar reminder last week, but if anybody would like to get copies of these things, um, just type your name in the chat box and I'll send it to you after the webinar. And then I see that Julie Wendroff, Wendorf, I apologize for that, has the question, uh, what is your stock response to the question, why do you need more money since you already get tax funding? Well, <laughs> we have a very easy response for that and that is that we are only using funds that we, um, well, that we fundraise for, for things that we cannot buy with tax dollars. So, you know, gifts for children at Hamilton Courts at Christmas, backpacks for food, for items that um, kids might take home with them. Other things, if we can, if it is a legitimate supply, then we are going to write it off as a supply from our budget. So that's something that's really valuable as part of the program planning is that we know and our people who plan programs know at this point what we can purchase with our own money and what we can't so we are only going after those items that we cannot purchase legally with tax funds okay. and then I have one more question uh, and this one is do you do most of your programs outside of the library or inside the building Oh, we do about 98% of them outside the library, <laughs> really. I mean, we do. one of uh, the aspects of our plan is for the library to be a destination, and we are doing more programming in the library, but um, it's hard. You have uh, working parents, it's very hard for them to bring their children to the library at the end of the day. They don't want to make that special trip. We have a low-income community. Um, the elementary school closest to us has a free and reduced lunch count of 91%. So a lot of these people are working two or three jobs. So definitely we try to take our programs to where the children are already located so that we don't have to work that hard to find the audience. But we do have to build the relationship with the schools or the preschools or whatever organization is out there so that part is already in place for us. Okay. Uh, and then I might need a little bit of clarification because I see that uh, Kim Blaha had the follow-up question, does that take more staff time? Kim, can you elaborate what specifically you were referring to? Um, and I see that we also have some people who have requested a copy of the slide deck or the PowerPoint after the session. Um, what I can do is a mass email just to everybody after the session's over, and I'll send everybody the forums, uh, the PowerPoint slide deck, and all of those things. Um, so let me 
backtrack a little bit. Uh, to be out of the building doing program. Oh, so does it take more staff time to do programming outside of the building than it would to do it inside of the building? It does. Um, we actually have an entire outreach department who does all of the the school outreach. So they go to every K through five classroom once a month and do um, curriculum based programming in the classroom for 45 minutes to an hour. That's what they do every single day. That is their full time job. Um, so yes, that does take a lot of staff time. And then as far as these other programs that we do, yeah, I mean, you have to incorporate the drive time. If you have to go buy supplies, you have to throw that in, all of that. It's going to take longer. You have to, I mean, obviously you have to clean up in your own building, but you might have a maintenance staff person who does that. When you go out into the community and you program, you have to make sure the area looks exactly, if not better than it did when you came. So yes, it does take more staff time, but you also get more participation. You know, if you have a program in the library, sometimes you only get two, three, four, five people that show up. If you go out to where they are, they're already there, so you're gonna have people. You're, you know that's gonna happen, so the payoff is bigger. And then uh, Kim had another follow-up, um, and she asked, so organization is the key, so how much, how much planning, I guess, or how many years did it take for you to have the system for your outreach department kind of finalized? For our outreach department, um, actually, it took us about two months to start it. Um, we sold our bookmobile to Lawrenceburg. Thank you very much for buying that <laughs> bookmobile from us. Uh, in 2003, um, over spring break. Um, in the fall of that year, we started doing programming in the classroom. It came as a request from one of our board members who said, uh, it's very hard for us to do field trips. Uh, we would like you to be a field trip in the box for us. So our outreach staff have between 80 and 90 programs that are curriculum oriented. Uh, teachers pick from those at the beginning of the year. Right now they're setting the schedule for the entire year. They will have that done the 1st of September. And these people, God bless them, they will do six programs a day and each program is 45 minutes with time at the end to um, to see materials. And one thing that we have been told is that for a lot of first and second year teachers, that our presenters are modeling good teaching practice and classroom management for those new teachers. And for those jobs, we do not hire MLS people. We are hiring people with degree in biology. We have teachers. We are hiring people who are presenters, who are classroom managers, who understand education. And I'm going to take a short break uh, in the questions uh, just to let everybody know that you can now start the process of downloading your LEU for this session. Uh, once you download the certificate and open it in the Word document form, you can type into the field for name and put your own name in the document and then just save a copy for your own records. Um, and so now going back to the questions, uh, some of the questions that we've got is, how many staff do you have total, both for your building and then just for your outreach department? Our outreach department is composed of two and a half full-time positions. They also work a night and a weekend a month in the library. Um, and our total FTE is usually 20 to 21. Um, and our staff count is generally 28 or 29, and we are open seven days a week. Uh, with outreach all so that's just the school outreach right. all the other outreach we do also our programmers get pulled for that so there's probably three four other people who go out into the community and do outreach as well just not full-time and then for your community engagement focus and your outreach do you focus mainly on children or adults uh, for the programming element and I think you already talked a little bit about the library vehicle, so we can skip that one. Um, so does your community engagement focus mostly on children or on adults or both? <laughs> um, mostly on children. We do have some adult outreach as well. We go to two of the local assisted living facilities and there is um, an apartment complex that is just 
um, for the elderly so that are still independent and can live on their own. So for those guys, we do outreach, but mostly elementary, which I see one of the questions is how many elementary schools do we have? Um, I think I counted 11. If you include the yeah, private schools, it's yeah. 11. So I think we have 11, so a lot of that, and then the low-income housing community, the programming we do there is also for kids, so. Well, and that is very specific and strategic because as our board had these initial conversations, they feel that the way to build community here is through children. These children may stay in our community and they may make it stronger down the road or maybe we just make their lives a little bit better and they move out of this community and they remember that and they take that goodwill to the new community that they move into. So a lot of our outcomes we will never see. We are just, it's kind of the wing and a prayer. We, you know, we hope that we will see some of it here. We hope that they will see that people care about them and they will want to stay. Nonetheless, if they move somewhere else, they will know that as children, their community cared about them. And then uh, one follow-up is, how many of the elementary schools have librarians or media specialists? Well, they all have a school library, uh, but none of the elementary schools have a school, what you might consider to be a, a, an endorsed certified school librarian. Okay. And then uh, one more question. Can you give examples of specific programming that you take to the elementary classes? Um, actually, we could send that to you, but um, like we have done programs on the Underground Railroad, the Civil War. We try to do, every program may have um, a book, um, some kind of a story, uh, it also has an experience, something that is a classroom activity that they can do as a class. And the presenter also leaves information with the teacher so that that teacher can build on that hour's worth of programming, which would include other activities, websites, and things like that. But as they plan our programs, these three women look at the curriculum standards for each grade and they build those programs based on that, based on teacher evaluations from the year before and teacher and principal requests. Well, I know some of the really popular ones. She said the Underground Railroad. They also do Indiana government and that's normally with the fourth and fifth graders and they do a Jeopardy game with that. That one they get rave reviews on. Um, they do Force in Motion, so that's a very STEM related program. And they are getting more requests for STEM programs all the time. And one of our staff uh, that is a program presenter in that department actually has a degree in biology. And that has for attending. And I will be sending out an email to everybody with all of the documents that you requested. Have a great day.